I'm going to tell you a story about why we're going to tell you some stories. So yeah, that's uh, my game. What? Yeah, my telling stories about telling stories. It's a meta story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we have a good friend named Warren Spector. He is a wonderful man. Uh, he's created many great games, Epic Mickey, all all, all sorts of wonderful stuff. Uh, and uh, we asked him to uh, be our closing speaker for this convention. And he enthusiastically said yes. He's given me keynotes and packs before. And he just was thrilled about being able to come here and uh, talk to all you guys. Uh, and then uh, he called up and said, hey, Mike. Um, it turns out that the school for game designers that I am opening at the University of Texas has its uh, first day of classes on the last day of PAX, or uh, the last day of uh, PAX Dev. So I'm not going to be able to make it. And I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> How could you have the single best excuse for missing PAX Dev ever? I'm not going to come educate a bunch of game designers because I'm opening a school for game designers. <laughs> like, I was like, I can't argue with that. I can't make you feel bad about that. So, um, so instead, I thought, all right, our brains are going to be turned to jello over the course of the previous two days. Uh, I thought maybe we would just get up here and tell some stories. Tell some stories. I want two, two best friends who are great storytellers come along, join me up here, so that we could just, we could just tell you some things that we, we've experienced over our lives that uh, are about you know, the interaction of games in our lives. And so, uh, so the, the three of us sort of knocked our heads together and came up with some things that we wanted to tell you. Uh, so um, that's kind of my setup. Uh, what do we do now? Well, do you want to lead off with... Uh, do you want to go first, or do you want one of us to go first? Here's your bag. Oh, there it is. <laughs> you realize I'm going to go the longest. Alright. <laughs> Whatever. Brag, brag, brag. Whatever. <laughs> Does this mic work? Is that a hot, is that a hot mic? Is it a hot mic? Is it hot? All right. <laughs> you guys are lying, right? Like this mic doesn't work. Thank you. All right. I'm going to tell you a story called The X Factor. Uh, this uh, was part of it, anyway, was published in the book The Bones, which was a uh, creation of our fine speaker, Keith, oh, sorry, Will Hindmarsh. I don't know if you guys got to go to his lecture today, but that thing was amazing. So uh, 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 this story is uh, called The X-Factor, and I hope you like it. This is a story about why my life is better than yours. Sorry. I'm sure I can come up with a story about why your life is better than mine. Like that night the drummer from Iron Maiden had you in a headlock. Though the photo in Kerrang! magazine's all blurry, and really, you're having trouble recalling how he got you kicked out of the Playboy Mansion anyhow. That was pretty sweet. This isn't that story. This story is about an FBI agent, and things moved from the Midwest to the Pacific Northwest, and a big blue bag of dice. It's April 1997. I'm in Renton, Washington, tapping out some no doubt brilliant innovation in game theory. My phone rings. It's Brian Lewis, Wizards of the Coast Chief Legal Counsel. Though Brian's a lovely fellow, I don't always look forward to his calls. When he wants to see, wait, see me, someone's jammed a wrench into the works of the game industry. Sometimes Brian needs me to remove it, and sometimes he needs me to jam it in tighter. This time, I'll hazard that the problem involves Dungeons and Dragons. Wizards, through the machinations of President Peter Atkinson and new Vice President Ryan Dancy, is pulling off the coup of a lifetime, buying the venerable TSR Inc. for the big business equivalent of a jelly donut. TSR has produced the D&D role-playing game for two decades, but it has fallen on hard times, born of player-based fragmentation and fear of innovation. On April Fool's Day, Peter came riding in like a paladin on a charger, promising hope and market supremacy to the downtrodden of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. However, 
There's the small matter of moving the desired elements of TSR 2,000 miles across the country to, uh, to Wizards headquarters here in Renton. This is a long and cumbersome process, and on this very day, TSR is still squarely in Lake Geneva, being dusted off and sorted out by bookkeepers and product managers. In Renton, there are just a few people who know anything about the behemoth that we just acquired. I'm one of those few. From the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s, I hung close to TSR, writing the occasional adventure or magazine article for D&D. I put myself through college that way. I know the game like the back of my hand. Truth be told, though, I don't like it. I don't like it as much as I used to, anyway. The collectible card game is the new hotness, and board games are rising phoenix-like in Europe. Who has time to roll polyhedral dice? Brian is of a like mind, but today, he needs me to be a D&D expert. Doubtless it involves sorting out the royalty payments on a Gord of Greyhawk novel, or figuring out which Ralph Partha miniatures fall under our copyrights, or some other mind-numbing task. What is it, Brian? I ask, teeth firmly gritted. Mike, he says, can you write a scene for the X-Files? <laughs> I've never seen the show. Absolutely, I said. <laughs> it's January 1993. It's morning in America, with a bright new presidential administration heading into office. I am drinking heavily. I am in a bar in Milwaukee. This is no ordinary bar. This bar is called the Safe House, and it is a spy-themed bar. You need a password to get in. There are secret doors and trick mirrors and chairs that rise up through the floor. The bar is subdivided into espionage-themed areas of the world. There's a Hong Kong section, and a Moscow tea room, and an ooh -la, la Paris bistro. I am currently in Berlin, just over the wall from Checkpoint Charlie. My friend Tim Beach, himself a designer at the aforementioned TSR, is celebrating his 30th birthday. We are stacking inverted shot glasses as high as our foreheads. Out of the corner of my bloodshot eye, I see a guy I know, and through him, I see a girl. I remember this girl. We were rolling dice earlier in the day. I was judging a D&D scenario, something about origami frogs, and she was there. I don't remember talking to her, but I do remember noticing she was at the table. I noticed things like that. The guy is going to score points with this girl. Even earlier in the day, I had whined about a computer disc containing some older D&D scenarios I wrote on something called a CPM machine. Now such things are detritus, dysfunctional and unloved, but the scenarios are locked in that disc and nothing I can find can read it. Mike, says the guy, I'm gonna make your day. I find that difficult to believe, I say, flipping over another shot glass. Yvonne has a CPM machine. So in lieu of introductions, I stand up and kiss the girl on the lips. <laughs> and then I offer the, her the only remaining chair at the table. I don't know what happens to the guy. It's May 1989. Special Agent Fox Mulder is in Baltimore. This is a season five flashback episode called Unusual Suspects. In the episode, Mulder meets a trio of conspiracy theorists named the Gold, sorry, named the Lone Gunman, including a long-haired geek named Richard Langley. Episode writer Vince Gilligan has labored to find the perfect setting to expound on Langley's geekiness. This, he decides, is a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Works for me. The scene as written involves the character Langley playing the character Lord Manhammer. Lord Manhammer? engaged in a gambling game of some sort, presumably in an inn with a name like the Dancing Doppelganger. He is wagering for real money, it seems. No one will take Lord Manhammer's wager until a hapless fellow named Elrond the Druid agrees to match his $50 bet. Then Langley picks up the dice and... and... well, what exactly? This is what the X-Files people want to know. What would a real D&D player from 1989 say? I take the script back to my desk and turn over a few phrases. A critical hit! Nah, too trite. By the power of Grayskull! <laughs> no. <laughs> it's too cutesy. A few hours later, I send back my revisions. The X-Files folks are ecstatic, but I'm not. I know what Hollywood is. My words will get churned and burned into something unrecognizable, and no one will ever know. 
It's September 1980. I'm in Seattle opening a blue box with a dragon on the cover. This is the Dungeons and Dragons base set. The first, basic set, sorry. The first release where the game is codified into mass market form. It's en route to selling a million copies, one of them to my mom's boyfriend for me. He thinks I'll like it, and I do. I get inspired by the adventure strangely numbered B1, In Search of the Unknown. This adventure lets the dungeon master, that's me, it's the first time I've ever been the master of anything. I get to choose the monster and treasure for all the rooms. I trap orcish raiding parties in rooms behind gelatinous cubes, blissfully unaware of the ecological consequences of my decisions. <laughs> From my airplane chair DMC, that's really true by the way, it was, it was literally an airplane chair, it was awesome. Uh, I run my, my wide-eyed 13-year-old friends through my creations. I am king of the world. I get fascinated by the oddly shaped dice. They're cheap plastic and I have to use a grease pencil to make the numbers legible. The four-sider has razor sharp points. The 20-sider has two sets of zero to nine. The tens column hasn't even been invented yet. <laughs> Neither has the D10. It's platonic or bust. And then I notice something very disturbing. It's an odd behavior amongst my friends. They bring their own dice and they call certain ones lucky. They blow on them for good fortune. They conduct elaborate shaking rituals. They ignore cocked results and rolls that land on the floor. They are mythologizing randomness. They have regressed a thousand years. <laughs> I do not do such things. At 13, empowered by the Tell Me Why series of kitty science books, I understand physics and probability. Dice are valuable because they're random. They are no more likely to produce a high number than a low number, no matter what has come before. This I explain. <laughs> My benighted friends gen gently comfort me and then go back to calling the black dice evil. <laughs> As such, I do not begin the process of hoarding dice in the manner of my friends. I get a small dice bag with a TSR logo on it and put the 20 or 30 dice I will ever need inside. This number never increases. Various dice enter my collection after rolling to my side of the table. Various dice leave my collection after being vacuumed into oblivion. Over the next 25 years, I, re I retain my original blue box dice for sentimentality and not many more. Well, the metal ones. It's August, 1995. Yvonne and I are newly married, holding our wedding reception in the safe house, the spy theme bar in which we shared our first kiss. Gamer Bliss is ours. We're back in Chicago, packing up the apartment for a drive across the country. Attention turns to our separate game collections, now heading for the faithful amalgamation into one Uber collection. We overlap primarily on the Dungeons and Dragons material. Duplicate runs of Dragon Magazine and Monstrous Compendia folded in upon each other, threatening to break the backs of our movers. It is now two and a half years into our relationship that I first notice her dice bag. It's made of a lustrous blue velvet and tied with glistening silver cords. It contains dozens of complete sets of ornate dice, some pink, some glittery, some that change color at the touch. It's even got the original grease pencil 20 siders from the blue box, even though she would have been nine when the set came out. Yvonne is a cute chick that plays D&D, so guys from coast to coast have gifted her dice from the heart. The bag is a riot of color and it makes a satisfying clackety clack whenever it moves. It's a dice bag's dice bag. <laughs> Neat dice bag, I say. Where'd you buy it? Buy? She scoffs as only a new wife can. I made it myself. We get to Seattle and the boxes get unpacked. Ikea brings a shelf for our game books. Her dice bag gets a place on the top shelf. Mine gets buried somewhere. I don't miss it. We're married now. What's hers is mine. <laughs> it's June 1997. The X-Files people are calling back. We're shooting here in Vancouver, the prop lady says. Langley needs books for his D&D game. They need to be from 1989. Can you provide those? Absolutely, I say. I got you covered. 1989. 1989. This is a time when things are in flux. In early 1989, TSR releases the second edition Player's Handbook, a landmark tome that signaled a massive shift in the world of D&D. 
Gone are the demons, the devils, the assassins, the naked harpies, the tables on how to mix poisons. D&D gets scrubbed clean. This is greeted with alarm by a great many fans. In the spring of 1989, players turn up at conventions with buttons reading, Ye Revision Sucketh. <laughs> a crazy hybrid of old and new editions develops, where players use the sanitized player's handbook, while their diehard DMs use the original Dungeon Master's Guide and Monster Manual from a decade earlier. Langley, I decide, will be in one of these conflicted games. This means he needs a brand new second edition player's handbook from 1989. We can't use mine, because mine's a review copy with a giant hole punched through the entire book so that it can't be sold. I search around Wizards and find, in Peter's office, a near mint 2E PHB, with his name written in the corner of the first page. I butter him up with tales about how he's the bestest company president ever. And he parts with it. But the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, that's a different story. This needs to be beaten to hell. This I can provide. My 1E DMG spine is so ruined from teenage use, it's been sewed up with electrical tape. My 1E monster manual isn't much better. I bundle those with Peter, Peter's PHB in a DM screen and call the producers for a Vancouver address. But what about the dice? The prop lady asks. What about the dice, I wonder. With the FedEx deadline ticking down, I scour my house for my dice bag, my meager little dice bag. The kind that no self-respecting D&D player would be seen with on TV. What am I to do? Take mine, Devon says. There's no guarantee any of this is coming back, I say. You'll get it back. She assures me. <laughs> Hollywood. There's no way she's getting her handmade dice bag back. But I send it off anyhow. The producers are once again ecstatic. I am once again less so. It's August 2000. I'm again in Milwaukee, bestriding the halls of Gen Con, the largest gaming convention in America. You can tell when this was written, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, in the rafters, I see the colossal banner of Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, the most promising debut in the history of role-playing games. It has come far in the last three years, re-envisioned by three genius game designers named Monty Cook, Skip Williams, and Jonathan Tweet. I hold a sheaf of 100 photocopied chapters in my hand. In, the, uh, in each of these 12-page documents, Monty has written one of the finest pieces of writing in D&D's history, Chapter 1 of the new Dungeon Master's Guide. It tells prospective DMs on how to craft campaigns that sing, just like Monty's. I expect the 50 people attending my first two-hour seminar will like them. I made a few extra just in case people want one for their friends at home. This seminar is the preview of the DMG, which comes out next month. I'm the least senior of the four creative directors on the third edition relaunch, helping to mold the, re helping to mold the work of the best game design team I've ever seen. But mostly I'm getting out of their way. They know what they're doing, but you know, I'm one of the better public speakers on the team. And I've been running 50-person seminars at Gen Con for a long time, so I'm leading the panel. And then I turn the corner into the seminar room, which I rapidly discover seats 700 and stands maybe 100 more when at capacity. It's above that now. I turn to one of the younger wizard staffers and hand him my corporate Amex. Three blocks over, there's a Kinko's, I say. You have one hour and 55 minutes to get back here with 800 copies. I will, I will buy you a steak dinner at Morton's if you make it. <laughs> he gets the steak. Wizards accountants don't mind, because D&D is back. It's November 1997. A horde gathers around my TV to watch the broadcast debut of Unusual Suspects. I remind them once again, Hollywood. Their hopes should remain firmly in their pockets. It starts off pretty good. Richard Belzer shows up in the role of Detective John Munch from my favorite show, Homicide Life on the Street. Dig Dug makes an appearance. We all explode with laughter when Mulder pulls out a cell phone the size of a Welsh corgi. But then the D&D scene arrives. Okay, ladies, who's down for 50? Langley asks as the camera pans from one long-haired geek to another long-haired geek. 50 bucks, anyone 50 bucks? Oh man, my diaper-wearing granny would bet 50. Come on, there's no game here. A weird Alish geek takes his bet. All right, he says, 50. Elrond the Druid bets 50, Langley proclaims. 
as the camera pulls out to show a table of dragon statuettes and, yeah, there's my D&D books. And there's Yvonne's dice. Cash only, Elrond. I don't take no personal checks from the Bank of Middle Earth. Okay, so far so good, but here's the clincher. This is really where they could screw up the scene. I think of all the possible variations, none of them good. But everybody erupts in applause because the climactic line is exactly as I wrote it. Langley shakes his dice and shouts, Come on, natural 20! Daddy needs a new sword of wounding! <laughs> Holly. It's everything I hoped it would be. It's December 2005. I've moved on from Wizards, helping help relaunch D&D in the thunderous third edition, breaking every sales record on the planet and revitalizing roleplay. I've founded Lone Shark Games with some of my buddies like James Ernest, and I'm enjoying showing off my early successes. But I'm still hanging with my friends from the glory days. Right now we're in Anaheim at the Gen Con SoCal Game Convention. Ed Stark, a fellow creative director from that relaunch, calls me over. Hey Mike, I want to introduce you to someone, Ed says. Dean, this is Mike Selling. Mike wrote the line, Daddy needs a new sword of wounding. <laughs> Dean Haglin furiously shakes my hand. He's the actor who played Langley in the episode, and many others. Mike, I just gotta tell you something. When I'm signing autographs, that line is the one everyone asks me to write. <laughs> <laughs> Dean and I become fast friends. We're part of the lore, you see. The truth is out there. We're in. It. It's December 2012. I'm at the Child's Play Auction, raising money to get games to sick children. I'm at a table with Yvonne and genius cartoonist Chris Straw and two nattering harpies. We're in the live auction where Mike Prohulik and Jerry Holkins, Penny Arcades, Gabe and Tycho are announcing the featured items. One of them, 15 years later, is my D&D books from the X-Files. Everybody wants these. For many people here, that moment was the defining moment of their gamer history. Robert Koob has already asked me five times, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> this is part of your life, man. I'm sure, I say. Jerry is on, sta on stage talking about the first time Mike played D&D. It was three years ago, Mike says. You were there. <laughs> Jerry smiles. Like Jerry smiles. He knows that Mike's a neophyte, and Jerry most assuredly is not. He's a child of Langley, someone who was there when a D&D game showed up on the X-Files, and he saw himself on TV for the first time. The bidding starts at $100. I'm imagining Jerry as Lord Manhammer, hoping to get 50 bucks out of Elrond the Druid. And then it, well actually, I don't know. Because, I don't know what happens after that, because the nattering harpies won't stop nattering. Yvonne shoots them a glare like she's going to take a hockey stick to their faces. Yvonne's been in hockey fights before. <laughs> they shut the hell up. $2,100, Mike says. Going once, going twice, sold. A set of D&D books raised two grand to make sick kids happier. We did that, Vince. Dean, me, Fox Mulder's dumb cell phone, even par Elrond the Druid. That's a natural 20. It's May 2009. I've downloaded Unusual Suspects from iTunes. I'm going back over these events for the first time in years, and looking back at them, I realize why my life is better than yours. It's not because I got to write a signature line of the coolest TV series on the planet. That could have happened to anyone. Think of all the requirements that made me that guy. The X-Files had to write it into the mythology. The writer of that episode had to need help with the scene. The Wizards had to buy TSR that very month. All the people who worked at TSR had to still be in Lake Geneva, and I had to be in the office that day. That's just too much randomness. Too lucky a die roll. It could easily have been you instead. When we opened the box that came back from the set, Yvonne's dice bag was inside. But she couldn't have known it was, be, it was gonna be there. I married a woman who made her own dice bag and was willing to lend it to me to help me out with no certainty that she would ever see it again. That's why my life is better than yours. But hey, 
At least you got that Playboy Mansion thing. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Basically everyone is playing Minecraft now. So my son is nine, one of my sons, and he has a group of other nine to ten-year-old boys that all play Minecraft together. And I got sort of tired of him playing on these um, public servers, right? They go on public servers and they play. And, you know, he's nine. I don't know who these other people are. They're asking him how old he is. And I just imagine some guy in his underwear in his basement. And I'm like, no, this is not okay. Don't tell anyone who you are, or how old you are, or where you live, or you know what, just get off the computer and go to your room. <laughs> um, and so what, Minecraft, what Mojang offers is the ability to rent your own private server and only allow the people that you want to play on it. So I did that, I bought him a realm, and, uh, and he invited his friends onto it. So now I have a realm full of, you know, maybe 15 nine-year-olds, which is probably better than pedophiles, but comes with its own set of problems, uh, which is to say that they don't really understand other people's property and how important that is, especially when it's virtual. So it turns out that among his friends, there was some sort of terrorist bomber who took it upon himself to randomly strike uh, targets across the realm. Um, a beautiful five-story hotel would go up and the next day it was rubble. Uh, you know, I saw a racetrack that went up. I was amazed. It had like stand, like bleachers, and then there was a hole in it the next day. And at that point, there was no log. There was no, nothing I could look at that said, this player did this at this time, which to me as a gamer is crazy because every game I like World of Warcraft, right? I mean, you always have logs. There's a log is important. And I had no evidence. So the only thing I could do was call parents. <laughs> yeah, and that's a tough call to make because, because they don't give a shit about Minecraft. <laughs> and so I call up and I say, uh, you know, this is Gabe's dad, um, your son, well, I'm gonna change the name to protect the innocent, Billy, uh, plays on my son's Minecraft server. And I just wanted to ask you, and before I could even finish, they're like, what? Huh? My Minecraft what? It's a video game. Your son is playing it with my son. They play together. And I wanted to know if your son is blowing up my son's stuff. <laughs> and I, so what do you, they're like, what do, you, what do you mean? I don't understand. Someone is blowing things up in a virtual world that your son occasionally inhabits. <laughs> and I believe he might be the culprit. <laughs> Can you just ask him if he blew it up? And so I could hear them in the background going, Do you play a game called Minecraft? Yeah. Do you blow stuff up? No. He's not blowing anything up. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, 
Not maybe how I would have done it, but I appreciate the effort because if you ask a nine-year-old if they did something, they say no. <laughs> That's just what they do. So I was frustrated, Gabe was frustrated, some of the other kids on the realm were frustrated because this kept happening. Well, it happened that uh, a recent update a few months ago added a sort of log. It would tell you when a child logged in and when they logged out. Just a timestamp, basically. It didn't say like they placed a block here or they did this at this point. It just said they were online during this period of time. And I thought, well, that's something. We can maybe use that if we need to. And sure enough, there was another attack. Uh, this one, just horrible. A huge smoking crater. My son came to me in tears. It happened again, Daddy! And so I said, show me. Take me to the crime scene. So, so, I, go, I, I log in. And he takes me over to this crater, and uh, and he goes, "You got it, you dad. You got to figure out who it was." So I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, I'm like, "Oh, you can re can reset the server to a previous save. Is that right, son?" He's like, "Yeah, and it automatically creates backups." I said, "Start rewinding the server until these statues are there again. That's what I need you to do." So he starts going back. He goes back an hour, still a hole. A couple hours. Hole. He goes back a full day. Statues! And so I have a window of time where I know this thing happened. So now I, now I go into the logs, right? And now I'm like, they're like, enhance! Enhance! Right? Like, like, like I, can, I can read the license plate. Flip it. It's in the window. You can see the reflection. No. So I, go, I go in. And there's three kids who are on during that time. And I'm like, That's, I need more. I need more to go on. And in the meantime, I'm like, honey, I've got three names. I tell my wife, call these parents and see if we can get a confession. And if we, meanwhile, I'm going to be digging up more evidence. So I hear her on the phone in the background while I'm like typing. And she's like, it's a video game. Your son plays it with my son. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. So I'm like, I need to go back to the scene of the crime. There needs to be more evidence. So I'm looking at the, the statues, and I ask him, I said, I go, what exactly am I looking at? They're like 10-story tall statues. And he says, those are our avatars. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He goes, we, they, they all have their own custom avatars that they've designed for Minecraft, and each of them built a, like a one-for-one, -one, pixel-for-block replica of their avatar in the sort of center of this realm. And I was like, all right, I need to see your friend's avatars. So he pulls, he pulls up, he's got, they've all sent each other pictures. So I've got the photos and I'm looking at the statue. I'm like, well, two of these statues are two of the kids that were on, right? Like they, they're not gonna blow up their own avatar unless it's some kind of evil genius child, right? <laughs> He's gonna throw off the case. They'll never suspect me if I blow it. Like he built the whole thing. Anyway, like no, no nine-year-old is gonna do that. So at that point, I know who it is, right? It's this third little bastard that's been blowing everybody's shit up. And he goes, "Do you know who it is?" I said, "Yes, I know." And he goes, "Can I ban him?" I said, "No." Because it's Jerry's son, Elliot. <laughs> and, and Gabe's like, what are you, I, I'm going to ban him. He's a bummer. I said, no. I've worked with his dad a long time. I owe it to him. Like, I felt like a cop, right? Like, like you, you, you've been tracking this murder su like suspect, and it's like you find out it's your partner's son. You're like, I, I thought I should bring the evidence to you first. <laughs> So I'm like, no, I gotta, I gotta tell Jerry before you do anything. Just don't ban him yet. So I sent Jerry a mail. <laughs> he said, your son is a terrorist. <laughs> and a liar. Uh, he has been blowing shit up on my, my son's Minecraft realm for months and denying it to your face. And I have this evidence. And I laid out... I mean, a pretty incredible case. I thought I'd 
explained the window of opportunity, I had the logs to back it up, the avatar, I mean it all, it was, I laid it on his doorstep, this thing was done. And he sent back one email that just said, ban him. <laughs> I said, Gabe, do it, ban him, get it done. And I sent Jerry a text message a little while later. I said, is it going okay over there? And he, and he said, I'm going to call you because it was rough. And so he calls me up and he says it was, it's like he had him in the interrogation room, right? Like, you can imagine the, the single naked bulb sort of swinging back and forth. And Jerry's got his hands on the table. He's like, son, did you, have you been blowing things up in Gabe's Minecraft wrong? Elliot said, no, absolutely not. Just like he did every other time. He said, no, it wasn't me. Jerry says, we found dynamite in your inventory. <laughs> says, well, that was for something else. Well, you know dynamite is expressly forbidden on Gabe's realm. I didn't use it for anything. Well, we have logs that place you at the scene of the crime. Elliot had not heard about the new update and responded with, you couldn't possibly know that. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that sealed his fate. Okay? And so Jerry, Jerry says to me, listen, I got it out of him, but I think it's important you understand that this wasn't malicious. He was trying to create a portal at the base of these statues. And when you create a portal, you build sort of a frame of blocks with wood inside and you set the wood on fire and then poof, there's the portal. He says the fire got out. I said, fuck, that's bullshit. <laughs> I was there and I saw the blast pattern. <laughs> and I have screenshots to prove it. This was not a controlled burn. <laughs> the statues did not burn from the bottom up. This was absolute carnage. Blocks were thrown for miles. He must have used a truckload of TNT. This was a terrorist act. And Sherry's like, well, he apologizes that it got out of control. <laughs> He's never coming back on our server. And I think you need to have a serious talk with him about other people's property and terrorism <laughs> because he's a criminal. As far as I know, that talk has not happened yet. I think he's going soft on the kid. Uh, but when we were at uh, PAX, which is sort of like a mini convention before PAX, it's the weekend before PAX, we get together for SAX, which is where we stuff all the bags that we hand out to everyone at PAX. We just fill sacks all day. And so I'm sitting there and I'm stuffing a bag and it's like an assembly line. So, you know, Pat hands me the bag, I put my thing in, I give it to Mike. And my son is here and Jerry's here. And Jerry says, uh, did, I, did I tell you guys about the Minecraft camp that Elliot went to? And Gabe goes, did they teach him how to blow stuff up? So that was that was the end of that conversation. But that is that is my story. I'm sorry I didn't write it down. That is all I got. Thank you guys. Oh my god. Uh yeah, so um we wanted to uh do these stories because they're a little bit about family. Uh, we came, we, we looked at uh, Jamie, I hope you guys went to the keynote and heard uh, Jamie Chang's amazing thing where he talked about the importance of family. And so uh, we discovered that we all picked one story and it was about our, our loved ones, um, usually complimentary. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so Patrick, you ready to knock one out? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of strange to be up here. Because uh, I, I got to start gaming pretty early as well. The, the difference is, when I found out about D&D back in the fifth grade, I found out, because there were kids that would play it in the gym uh, during lunch hour, and I'm like, wow, this seems 
like a cool thing. And I'm like, you know, could I, could I play D&D with you guys? And they're like, no. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of us, maybe that are a little older, remember the days when it really wasn't that cool to be a geek. So go back to that point in history in your mind and think what the kid is like who the D&D kids will not play with. <laughs> Just, just giving you a little context. Did you still have the beard back then? <laughs> I can actually picture fifth grade Pat with a full beard. That's absolutely right. I should, I should post up. Yeah, and, and I've been thinking about that a lot because in the new fifth edition, like my book is mentioned, and that, and that dedication page, like the, the whatever. And I, I was looking at that, thinking. I was the kid that the D and D kids would not play D and D with, you know, like reading the books by myself, thinking, "Wow, this would be a really fun game if I had anyone to play it with," <laughs> you know, like making an adventure and then playing the adventure myself. It's, uh, yeah, and where, the, that one. and where the hell are those guys now? Yeah. Right? I mean, like, look where you are. They're uh, they're probably all really well adjusted, oh, happy lives. Damn, damn, that's probably true. <laughs> The other interesting, you know, eventually I fell in with uh, people who didn't know how not cool I was, and we would all play games all through college. And we considered ourselves pretty hot shit. You know, we'd play a bunch of games, and we would do, and, and this is, I can tell this to you guys, because I first met game designers about two years ago. I went to Origins, mostly because I was stalking uh, Will Wheaton and Felicia Day. And while I was there, I met some game designers. And I'd always thought that me and my crew were like some pretty badass game players. Because we'd play games, we'd pick a game up and, you know, play it once, and we'd be like, okay, we get this, we'll play it a few more times. Criticize the rules, right? We're like, oh, this is pretty ambiguous. Oh, boy, you know, this, how could they leave something like this in the game, right? <laughs> um, and of course, we all think that we could do it. And then I meet game designers, and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's like, we are entirely different species <laughs> of human beings. It's like, we were skilled amateurs that would play games, but after meeting people who actually design games, it's like, yeah, there's a big difference between enthusiastic amateurs and people whose brains actually work this way. <clears throat> But, that said, I've got to kind of dabble my feet in a little bit, and the big thing that's happened to me in these last couple of years is I've started playing games with my little boy. So, I wrote mine down, because that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, why wouldn't you? That's <laughs> a, yeah. Just seems courteous. <laughs> totally polite, yeah. I've got to do something instead of working on book three. <laughs> I'm just going to get that joke in before anyone else gets it. <laughs> I just managed to sit down at the computer and start on my email today when I heard a very distinctive type of silence in the hallway outside my office. Our stairway is noisy, you see. If an adult goes up or down, each step groans. But someone lighter, someone child-sized, can come up the stairs with barely any noise at all except for a tiny creak here or there and the tiny tamping of a tiny foot. I looked up and saw Hoot standing outside the doorway, positioned so I couldn't see him at all unless I leaned over in my chair. He knocked on the door frame very softly. His feet had made more noise. This is something we've worked hard to instill in him. I have an old Model M IBM keyboard. It's clicky, and you can hear it easily from anywhere in the house. The rule is that if I'm typing in my office, he isn't supposed to come up in or bother me. Hence the sneaking up the stairs, hence the quietest of quiet knocks. Hello, my sweet child. I reach out for him and he comes over to give me a hug. He kisses my arm. Dad, I was wondering if... He looks around the room. I was wondering... His eyes continue to dart around almost desperately. He's four, and at this age, I can still read him like a book. He isn't really wondering anything. He doesn't really want anything in particular. He just wants to spend time with me. 
and time has been in short supply lately. I'm scrambling with my team to get ready for the launch of our yearly World Builders fundraiser. I've been spending hour after hour emailing people, looking for authors and publishers who would like to donate books, looking for corporate sponsors, looking for game designers and musicians and members of the geek glitterati that might be willing to help us spread the word. And if that weren't enough, we launched a huge sale in the Tinker's Packs that's running through the weekend. I've been trying to promote that as well. You see, I am a fixer by nature. I want to make things better. It's not just something I like to do. It's closer to being a compulsion with me. Generally speaking, I don't mind this particular twist in my psyche, but it leads to some problems. Because if you're clever enough, you can see how almost anything needs fixing. And, not to put too fine a point on it, but I'm fairly clever. I also subscribe to Terry Pratchett's philosophy of personal isn't the same as important. The last problem is that I'm good at math. Again, any of these are good things. The problem is when you put all three of them together. If you're good at math and you like to fix things and personal isn't the same as important, you end up coming to some really hard conclusions. One of these conclusions is that if I spend an hour sending out a few more emails, I can probably get a few more people to blog about the sale and the Tinker's Packs. And this will easily bring in another $1,000 that we'll be able to donate to Heifer International. $1,000 means nine or 10 goats go to needy families. That means nine or 10 families have more food, more money, healthier children, and a vastly better lifestyle. Not just for a month or two, but for forever. And the effect snowballs because goats have babies, and then what's more important, improving the lives of nine families or me spending an hour with my son? The cruel mathematics of the situation are pretty clear cut. I want to spend time with my boy, but making the world a better place is more important. So nine times out of 10, I make that choice. And so my boy is constantly desperate to spend time with me, and I am lonely for him. Dad, he says, Dad, I was, he looks at the rug, the wall, my robe. Dad, I was wondering, would you like to play the B game, I ask. Oh yeah, he says, jumping just a little bit in his excitement. I would love to. So we go into the other room and play the A, B, C match game. In some ways, it's the perfect game for his age. Letter identification, reading, spelling. I believe the term is edutainment. It's a pretty game, too. Comes in a tidy little package shaped like an actual bee. But in terms of game design, it is a fucking mess. <laughs> the balance of the game is way off. And they should have brought in somebody with some serious math to design what letters go on which dice and how many. Because right now, there tends to be a point in the game where you roll and nothing happens. And then you roll and nothing happens. And again and again. Now, I'm aware that this isn't supposed to be go. The point is having fun with my child. But still, it's bad game design and broken things bother me. Broken things want fixing because I am, at the very heart of me, a fixer. Plus, it makes the game drag on. It's not monopoly bad, but it's pretty bad. A child's game should be done in 10, 15 minutes. It should not take half an hour. Exacerbating this is the fact that Oot loves to shake the dice a lot. Those of you that play a lot of games know how irritating dramatic dice rollers can be. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying hard to enjoy myself and relax, but it is hard, and the game is flawed, and Oot is distractible, and the game has just dragged its way past 40 minutes, and here's the key thing, there are kids starving to death in the other room. <laughs> That's what it feels like to me. A couple days ago, I wrote a blog about how I had a moment of happiness during Thanksgiving because not only did I give myself the night off work, but I gave myself the night off thinking about work. This is quite possibly the central problem in my life right now. You see, if I work on my book, I feel guilty because I'm neglecting my son. If I play with my boy, I feel like I'm neglecting my work. And if, God forbid, I take some time by myself to play a game or read a book or goof off on Facebook, I feel twice as guilty. There are so many things that I should be doing, and I can't do all of them, let alone all at once. So I'm laying on the floor, playing the B game with my son, trying desperately not to be irritated and impatient, 
I can't get bitchy at my little boy for wanting to roll his dice in a certain way. That is unacceptable behavior. Then he leans, goes on to all fours, and starts to crawl away from his dice. And I know I shouldn't snap at him for getting distracted. He's four. That is okay. But even so, I need to finish this game because there are starving kids in the other room. And so I open my mouth, and despite my best intentions, I know what I am going to say will end up sounding like irritated, disappointed dad. But he's not crawling away. He was just coming closer to give me a kiss on my leg. And then he goes back to the dice. It's the sweetest thing. We play for another minute or so. I shake and roll. He shakes and shakes and shakes and shakes and shakes and shakes and rolls. And then he says, you should always remember this time. I look up at him. What? <laughs> you should always remember this time, he says. Right now. It was so uncanny. It was something I never would have dared to make up in fiction because it would be too unbelievable. If I'd ever read anything like this in a piece of fiction, I would have rolled my eyes at it and instantly thought less of the author. <laughs> I didn't want to press him any further on what he meant. He's bashful about that. And honestly, I was a little scared. <laughs> If for no other reason than the fact that if something happened to him, it would destroy me. There would be nothing left of me to put back together. I just agreed with him instead, because you should agree with someone when they make a very good point. <laughs> You're right, I said. I should remember this time. That's why I decided to write this down, you realize, so I would always remember that time. We went back to playing the game, and I managed to relax a bit, but not as much as I'd like to. Because as much as I want to relax and spend the whole Saturday afternoon with my boy, the truth is there are kids starving in the other room, and I don't know how to stop caring about that. As with all true stories, there's no good ending to this one. No good resolution. No closure. Just the stopping point. I'm sorry about that. <laughs>